Hello and welcome back to Friday Minis. Now, you've probably seen this diagram, which is often used to explain multitasking, right? So with a single processor, you can jump about between different tasks by, well, essentially sharing the time, and that allows you to, well, appear to do multiple things at the same time. This is fairly basic. But today, I want to delve even deeper into the low-level implementation of such a feature, and that will involve the world of interrupts. The idea is this, your CPU processes instructions right one by one. You have a program counter, which is a register that tells you whereabouts in RAM to go to read out the next instruction. So in a normal execution of a program, you essentially go, well, slot by slot. Sometimes some instruction tells the PC to go somewhere completely different, but yeah, you're basically executing instruction after instruction. An interrupt can come in the form of a hardware signal and can come anytime. It is asynchronous because it's not generated as part of the software execution process. It just comes about from perhaps some error on a peripheral or the press of a button. So at any time, the signal can come along to your processor and what happens is your program counter jumps away to a completely different block of code. This block of instructions is known as an interrupt handler or an interrupt service routine, which is often shortened to ISR. So yeah, basically you get this. Instead of continuing along with the program, your processor takes a slight diversion and goes over to, well, do the ISR. So it's responding to the interrupt request when that is done, it returns back to where it's left off, and we carry on. One very basic application of interrupts on a computer is, well, when you're typing on your keyboard. Have you ever noticed, well, at least in the earlier days when computers crashed more frequently and usually more catastrophically, you may have noticed that if your computer actually manages to recover from it, whatever keystrokes you have typed while your computer was frozen is actually remembered, they're not lost. Why? Because they were implemented by interrupts. The idea is whenever you press a key, whatever your processor is tied up doing, that gets put aside for a short while, your keystroke is put into a buffer. So even if the program that's supposed to be taking in keystrokes is not responsive at the moment, your keystrokes go into the buffer and they stay there until, well, whatever program wants it. So in fact, even though using a keyboard feels like this, it is in fact more like this. There is a buffer sitting in the middle, you know, just holding all your keystrokes and your program is reading them off as and when it's ready. Of course, you could still make that buffer run out if your computer is unresponsive and whenever you press a key in that state, your computer should make a beeping noise. I would demonstrate that to you, but I don't think I can freeze a modern computer in the same way. Anyway, here's another example using the Arduino microcontroller this allows us to look at interrupts at a slightly higher level. When written in a high-level programming language, in this case, a version of C++, you can see that the interrupt routine is essentially a callback function. When a particular pin on the Arduino is detected to be on the rising edge, we respond by calling the ISR. Now, doing interrupts with the Arduino allows us to have some interesting insights into how interrupts are actually, well, handled at the lower level. You see, if you read about Arduino interrupts, you will find a few standard pieces of advice. First of all, keep it short and simple. And second, don't expect everything to work as you would expect within the ISR. This to me was super interesting. As it turns out, you can't really interrupt and interrupt, at least in the world of the Arduino. And what that means is things that require interrupts to work won't work when the interrupt request is being handled. So of course, if you're going to use interrupts to take in inputs, then if you are already handling another interrupt, you may miss that input. That's why usually even if we want to do something complex in response to an interrupt, all the interrupt really does is it sets a variable. What your main code does then is it looks for that variable, which acts as a flag. If it sees that that variable has been tripped off, it will respond accordingly in the main thread. So that is how we typically use an interrupt. What's also interesting about this is that certain functions don't work in interrupts. Typical examples may include things like timers or delays, because as it turns out, certain timing functions are implemented by hardware timers, which tell the time to the processor by using interrupts. 
That to me was extremely interesting because that was a really smart way of synchronizing, you know, a separate timer with your processor. So yeah, there you have it. That interrupts in a nutshell, a very interesting approach to solving a problem that could be quite difficult otherwise. You can imagine without interrupts, we'll have to keep essentially polling just to find out the state of something which may not change for a very long time. So yeah, interrupts, pretty cool. That's all there is for this episode of Friday Minis. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.